All right. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Yes. Nice. All right. Um, and this is the PowerPoint. So welcome if you're joining on YouTube or on the webinar. You know, this is introduction to Elixir security today. So my name is Michael Lubis. I'm the founder of Praxeal.io, which is a security product for Elixir and Phoenix. My professional background is in software security. So I've worked for a few different companies in a pen testing or as a security engineer role. I'm also part of the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation, which is a great organization. I'm part of the security working group. So here's my contact info. You can send me an email or connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active there if you have questions or thoughts about the, the webinar after we're done. So Praxeal.io, um, here's a few of the use cases. So it's essentially a application security platform. So people use it to replace reCAPTCHA, detect OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities. If they have to do scanning for compliance, those are just a few of the use cases. The current customers, here's um, a few of them that have you know, shared case studies or they're on the website right now. Um, Betafee is really cool because they are a user research platform, which is a really like important aspect of modern software development. They installed Praxeal.io before their launch day and then actually blocked an attack when you know they went live. Um, essentially, that could have been like a very bad security incident, but they were able to mitigate it pretty quickly. So that's kind of a brief introduction to Praxeal.io. For the content of this webinar, though, we're going to be focusing on common Elixir security problems from a developer perspective and how you would mitigate them. So Praxeal.io, you know, it's a tool for Elixir security, but with that in mind, you still need to have some knowledge about security to use really any security software effectively. And naturally we need kind of an example application to talk about, like having a concrete example, I think makes all of this a lot easier. So Potion Shop is a Phoenix application with a number of vulnerabilities. And I'm going to walk you through today, you know, what does the vulnerability look like? How do you detect it? You know, what goes into it? So let me switch over here. And this is the Potion Shop interface. Um, I'm just going to kind of walk you through what is the web application. This is actually like the first step when you do a security, you know, assessment or a penetration test in real life. Literally, the first thing that you always do is just use the application and figure out, you know, what context is this thing operating in? So Potion Shop, it's not, you know, like a full on, like real web application with like credit card processing and everything, but just consider like a small business that's selling, you know, drinks or something online. What does that web application look like? You know, people from all over the internet. Um, can, can sign up for an account here. They can, you know, look at products. They can probably purchase them. So the basically the number of people that can use this is very big. And that's something to keep in mind just to start like, what are the security problems that can happen here? So you can see, you know, kind of a standard web application. There's a login function where I would just go here to log in. I have, you know, different potions. This one says Feather, for example. I can view it. And this is interesting because people can actually leave reviews. Um, and the security relevance of this fact is that, you know, the application is taking user input, but it's also returning it and showing it to other users. So cross-site scripting is a concern here. Um, and this is a really common just way that modern, you know, web apps work is like social media sites or online shopping sites. You have to be mindful that input that you take is going to be shown to other users. Um, you can see there's also a search function here. So I could search for cure, for example, and see some potions. Um, another thing just when you're doing assessments is to just kind of, you know, send it like an error. And you can see I'm running it in debug mode here so I can get a list of all the routes and things. Um, this is useful because each one of these endpoints is like a point where you could send user input. And this is going to be repeated throughout this webinar because the really the root of all of these web application security problems is you are taking user input from the internet, which is not trusted at all. Anyone in the world can send you anything, and you have to ensure that you're handling that input in a secure way. So this is Potion Shop. 
Um, we're actually going to do a group discussion now. So if you want to unmute um, and kind of talk, um, I'm going to go through an exercise with you. So this is just very basic, a risk assessment. I want you to consider the login and registration page of an online shopping site, which is what I kind of just showed you there, where you can log in. What are the security risks related to the login function, password reset, and creation of a new account? So just think about this. Consider like a real web application. What are some security risks related to this? So feel free to unmute. Um, also, also check on chat right now and see if anyone posts anything in chat. But yeah, just take a second and kind of think through it. I'm thinking of the dumb and obvious things, Michael, like if somebody puts in something that generates an error, you do not want to see that call stack because that's giving that's giving some, someone who's trying to, you know, attack your site, like here's a whole list. Um, so that's one thing that I would think you would immediately want to try and, you know, shut it off outside of development. Um, I don't know if that might already be there in Elixir. I don't, I don't think I ever paid attention. Yeah, exactly. Another, thing, oh, another thing is like the email address. If somebody's using a regular expression to check that email address, there are denial of service attacks against regular expressions. Um, so that'd be something to be, be aware of. Um, any kind of like uh, SQL injection on either one of those, the email or the password, would be something to be aware of. Yeah, exactly. All of that's correct. Um, sorry, someone else gonna go? But yeah, all of those points are correct. Um, kind of like error conditions that can happen. Um, the good news about Elixir and Erlang is it has really good error handling. So you typically don't see that kind of problem in production, but yeah, that can absolutely happen. Um, another kind of simple example would be you know, imagine you have a lot of users, let's let's say, that are reusing their email and password across different sites. So, you know, some random website suffers a data breach, and then all of those username and password pairs are now public. So somebody could write a bot to just try, you know, thousands of login attempts. And if somebody reused that username and password, they could log in, you know, to this site and order, you know, things with their saved credit card, probably. Um, that is really, really common and a reason people need like rate limiting or CAPTCHAs um, on these pages. CAPTCHAs really aren't a nice thing to do to your users. Uh, Praxial.io is in that area of stopping bots. Um, but you can kind of see the root cause of, you know, why you, why you need to do a risk assessment. Um, I'm looking at chat as well too. And brute force attack to guess credentials. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Just imagine somebody had a list of the most common 100 passwords and they were just brute forcing that. You know, that happens all the time and it's something you need to be aware of. Um, I have a list here too that just kind of shows you like, this, this is just what I could have come up with. There's more, um, but like password brute forcing, which we talked about, spam or bot account creation. Um, that's often done for credit card fraud, which is really bad as well. Um, you can also do email spam where if you create a lot of like new accounts or not a lot of password resets, you know, someone can spam the password reset form and it's like, okay, big deal. Some emails got sent, but if too many emails are being sent through your backend email provider, um, let's say you have like a cloud, like a cloud hosted service, your bounce rate can go up and you can actually get banned from the provider for sending like too many bad emails. That's, that does happen, unfortunately. Um, you could pick the wrong algorithm for password storage. There could be a logic flaw in your authentication. Um, there's this problem called data races that Elixir actually protects you against, um, but that, that can actually cause this problem where you log into the wrong account. Um, it's happened in banking before and it's really serious. Um, you could also have third-party JavaScript on the page, you know, like reading people's private data. So this is just one kind of area and you see like all the things that can go wrong. Um, so that's why you have to kind of consider like the context of, you know, this is a, 
web application that's handling customer transactions and you need to be mindful of these things. So with that in mind, now I'm going to move into kind of a technical example, which is uh, SQL injection. So the term SQL injection is very well defined in InfoSec literature. It's a kind of attack against web applications where, you know, you have your Elixir and Phoenix app and it's interacting with a database, typically through Ecto, but essentially you're taking some user input and then you're running a SQL query. So for example, imagine you just one, you know, select everything from the fruit table where the quantity is greater than hundred and the secret, you know, value is false and 100 is set by user input. So now consider an attacker that wants to view the fruit that is secret. This is just kind of a basic example, but it's more to illustrate like how the security boundary is being violated. So you go select from fruit where quantity is greater than zero or one equals one semicolon and then a comment. So this is the SQL statement. Um, what, so you. Think about like where quantity greater than zero or one equals one. This just evaluates to true in the kind of order of operations for SQL. So all of the fruit is going to be selected now. Everything after the comment is going to be ignored. And now an attacker can kind of arbitrarily run a SQL query. And the reason this is really bad is, you know, you can view the secret fruit like big deal. But then in real attacks, you can dump user credentials, you can modify you know, values in the database, it's sort of like having access to the production database through this flaw in your Elixir code, which is, which is not good at all. Um, this is a really famous uh, comic where there's a mom and she gets a phone call from her school and she's saying, hi, you know, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble, you know, and the mom asks, did he break something at school? And the school says, in a way, and the school asks, did you name your son Robert? Um, like kind of end statement, drop table students, and, and then like a comment. So the joke is that this mom named her son like a SQL statement and the school, you know, enters the student's name into some application database. And this, you know, caused the whole thing to get deleted. Um, so that's like kind of the joke of this comic, um, but it illustrates like a security problem that's very relevant to developers, you know, today. So in Elixir and Phoenix, the Ecto library is the thing that prevents SQL injection. Um, I'm going to show you an example now of kind of how that works, but does anyone have any questions? Uh, you can just unmute or post them in chat. Um, I'll pause for a sec here. All right, nice. So this like kind of example code I'm going to show you is sort of how Ecto prevents SQL injection. So most of this, like this code here is probably familiar to most people on this call, this like kind of from F and fruit where quantity is greater than or equal to and secret is false. This is just a normal Ecto query. Um, I've actually had people ask me about Praxial where they said, hey, like I don't trust Ecto because it's just an open source library. I want some additional security. Could Praxio help with that? The thing is, Ecto is, is really good. If all of your queries just look like this, you're safe. Like SQL injection won't happen because the library handles the sanitization of the queries, of the user input into the query for you. So if all of the code in your application looks like this, you're fine. But there is um, a feature of Ecto called Fragment, where you can actually, you know, inject like a SQL query into the Ecto query that's being generated. So, for example, you know, you DC Fragment from quantity greater than equal to, and then we have kind of have like a string interpolation here. This is where you would kind of expect SQL injection to happen if you had a real like a pen test going on. But you can see here. This is a, a compilation error from my IDE. It says Ecto query compilation. To prevent SQL injection attacks, fragment does not allow strings to be interpolated um, as the first argument by the pin operator. So if I try to compile this, this will actually fail. 
So this won't work if you're trying to find a SQL injection vulnerability. Ecto has you covered on this base. But let's consider the kind of parameter approach. So this is cget fruit, same basic query, where you know f name is like um, question mark, and then you know secret is false, and then you have min queue. So what does this question mark mean? It is a parameter in the query. So what you're telling Ecto here is that hey. You know, we expect this input to be coming from an external user, so treat it like it's malicious and, and parameterize it correctly. So this is not vulnerable. So let's go to this example now where we have, this looks like a SQL query that somebody pasted into their Elixir code. And you can see we're using Ecto Adapters SQL query. And if you actually run um, Soblo, which is the stack analysis tool, I'll show you in a little bit, um, it will actually flag this as vulnerable. But it's not. This is not vulnerable because you are taking the user input and treating it like a parameter in the SQL statement. So if you run you know, this code with external user input, it actually won't be vulnerable to SQL injection. So even though you're using the raw SQL adapter and you know, this code style just looks vulnerable, you're actually still safe. You have to get, so, so this is four examples now. We have A, B, C, D. We finally get to the vulnerable example where you can see you're just interpolating the value directly into the query, and that's why you're vulnerable. Um, so you can see like Ecto does a very good job of trying to have a guardrail that says, don't go off this path, you know, stay on this path. It's secure. But if you really want to, you definitely can write code that is vulnerable to SQL injection. So now that I've kind of walked you through that, let me show you what this looks like dynamically when you run it. So now you can see we have our list of potions, um, but there's only a certain number of potions that you're really allowed to see, which is seven. So I'm gonna do this string, which is or one equals one. So this is gonna end the SQL query, and then I'm gonna search. And notice that additional potions are now viewed. These are the secret ones. I, I shouldn't be able to see these. And let me walk you through what is happening. So this kind of route, if we start at the router here, is just going to be the base one. And we're just going to go to potion controller. And you can see we just have like potions, the search potion function. So we're going to go to potions here. And yeah, this like this is the code that is vulnerable. You can kind of, it looks like it. And you can see we're doing where potion name is like this value, and then we're doing the query. And the way you can really tell it's vulnerable too is let me just show you the like a normal thing where you do query from potions. Notice that you know you're doing select from potions where potion secret is equal to false, and this empty list is your list of parameters. So if you do, oh, this this will actually work. I'll show you. So notice I have like potions here. So this is like potions two. And then that two integer that you see up here, this is you know being treated as a parameter to the SQL query. So that's why it's here. Um, and then the potion ID, that's the parameter. But if you go and let's say I you know do this malicious string here, see what's happening is this query is being constructed where potion name is like you know a or one equals one. And now everything after this is being ignored. And there's, it's not being, the, the user input is not being treated as parameters. That's why this is vulnerable. So if you want to check, you know, is my application vulnerable to this problem? There's a really nice tool called Soblo. So you just do mix Soblo. It's installed in the Elixir mix file here. And I'll show you the SQL injection finding. It looks like this. It points you right to the file. So potions on line 20. And you can see, yeah this is absolutely vulnerable. You can see we're using the raw query. Um, that's, that's the problem. So one thing with Soblo, it doesn't provide too much context on, you know, is this, let's say you didn't know anything about SQL injection. You know, it's green, it says low confidence. It almost looks not that bad compared to the ones up here. No, oh, thank you, VS Code. Sorry about that. But yeah, you can see it's like green. It says low confidence. It actually doesn't have severity compared to like missing content security policy, which is 
not really as bad. So this is a feature of Praxial IO actually. So now this is like the Praxial product that people pay for. Um, you run mix praxial.scan. Let me show you mix praxial.scan. So I have Praxial installed in this you know, project as well. It does the scan. It actually does three scans. Um, I'm just going to focus on you know, the, the Sobo scan that's part of it right now. The reason that this is like useful from a, you know, why do people buy this? They want, you know, a record of each scan that happened. It's very useful for compliance. Um, you don't want to have to be pulling out like your CI logs when you get audited. It's, I've been in a similar situation. It's not fun at all. Um, so we're interested in the SQL injection finding here. So this is the default Sobo finding. And then if you click on finding details here, you get kind of a description of, of what it is. So the severity, you know, this is a high severity finding. Um, an attacker can steal your entire database. Um, and then there's kind of a description of how do you verify it. So all of this stuff I wrote, um, it's actually open source as well. So you get it in line if you're paying for Paraxial as a, as a customer. But then I'll also show you the, uh, the blog post here. If anyone has kind of watches the Elixir news, this is the one with the lighthouse. Um, but you click here, it's on the Praxial GitHub, every single, um, yeah, the SQL injection one, it's UUID 17 in uh, Soblo. But all of this data is open source, essentially, um, if you want to, to access it. It gives you some info about like, what it is, how to use it with Soblo, um, you know, what do you do? So now that we've kind of covered the Ecto thing, I'll take a break and I'll, I'll read chat for you. Uh, oh, we have a comment. So... It seems like you really need to work hard to expose a SQL injection vulnerability. The defaults in Ecto are pretty smart. Yeah, this actually came up too during a course I taught for ElixirConf um, EU. Even if you get like a SQL injection problem, Ecto still has like another sandbox layer where it'll stop you from like chaining it into another SQL query. Like it kind of limits you. One of the students was trying to exploit it to like drop the database and it, his attack didn't work. Um, so Ecto is, Ecto is a really good piece of software, for sure. Mm. Uh, in the Potion app, do you have any example of um, in, injection problems having to do with the binary JSON, like JSONB, Postgres fields, and the running queries on them? Not specifically for that. There is a problem for binary to term in Elixir. Um, I'm not covering it in the webinar today just because I don't have everything prepared, but there's a blog post up. If you search like Elixir remote code execution, it should pop up. Um, it's on It's on a similar topic to that, but that is a very oh, yeah, important, course. yeah. Yeah, I look for that. All right, nice. So for the next example, let's talk about cross-site scripting. So consider you know, the potion shop example. Somebody is logged in and they want to make a purchase. Now the JavaScript that's running in their browser session, you know, it should be approved by the potion shop developers. You know, what are the negative impacts if an attacker could inject JavaScript on the page? And this is really tied into the user sessions thing, where if somebody can execute JavaScript when you're logged into a website. They've basically taken over your account. You know, they can steal your session cookie, even though there are protections against that. There's like a flag in cookies that say JavaScript can't read this value. By the time an attacker has like JavaScript execution, they can just create a pop-up that says, Hey, you know, we need you to re-authenticate. Could you please enter your password again? And that'll probably work. Um, it looks normal and they'll steal your password that way. Or they'll use the JavaScript execution to like, you know, spam new posts by you. So let's say the new post function is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. You know, one person gets infected, then another person makes a post, another per person makes a post. This actually, this actually happened to MySpace back in the day. I'm probably dating myself where MySpace got taken down by a cross-site scripting worm for a few days. More recently, not recently, like the past month or so, but a few years ago, Twitter had this problem where somebody made a tweet that if you viewed it, you would tweet the same thing and took over the platform. Um, so that's 
you know, all of that goes back to cross-site scripting. In Phoenix specifically, it's really hard to introduce uh, cross-site scripting problems though, because Phoenix HTML handles all of that for you. If you're using the default kind of Phoenix patterns, you're completely protected against cross-site scripting. So this kind of uh, pattern should be familiar, you know, the, the templating where you're taking some input and then you're putting it in a template in Phoenix and then it's getting rendered safely where it'll look like, you know, less than greater than. Um, so you can't render a literal like bold or a italicized HTML tag or a script tag. Um, the thing is though, in Phoenix, you do have the ability to do raw. Um, and I've actually used this safely in my work where I had some values, they were coming from a database or they were generated by some code that I wrote. So user input would never reach it. Um, it was for like rendering a graph in JavaScript. That, that's where I found raw useful. So that's, you know, why this exists, but you never want to call raw on input that's coming from users because it can lead to cross-site scripting. What's cool about Phoenix too is you can, you can actually just read like the engine code that does this. And these are the escapes. Like the big five are, you know, less than, greater than. And then these symbols, they get translated into this. So in our potion shop example today, there is a coding mistake where we're calling raw on review.body, which is not good because the body of a customer review is naturally user input. So somebody can have an have a review that just opens a JavaScript alert. This is like the standard way that you demonstrate something's vulnerable to cross-site scripting. But you can imagine an attack where, you know, this says something like hacked by, you know, a, a guy, and then it executes in your browser and it spams all the reviews. And now everyone's account is compromised and the it looks like the whole website got hacked. Um, it's not not a good situation for for the business. Um, but for our example today, we're just going to open this prompt that says one. So let me go back to Potion Shop and I'll show you how this, how this looks. So you can see I'm literally just creating a view that's script alert one. Well, actually what I want to show you too is, let's see if I can do bold and say like, hello world. What will this look like? So yeah, you can see like it's it's being interpreted as HTML. It's not, you know, being like what you would expect to see is literally like the bold tags, not having them interpreted as HTML. So yep, you submit the review and you can see anyone that used this potion now, JavaScript that you know I wrote, it gets executed, uh, which is not good. So, you know, Jack is another user on this site if you've used this potion. And like, you can see how this would cause problems on like Amazon or something where everyone's signing up, creating an account, submitting reviews, it would, it would be a very bad situation. So um, same, same kind of situation where with cross-site scripting, it pops a, a findy in Soblo. So we can see it's on the show HTML, H-E-X. So yeah, this is the, this is the, Line 19, yeah, raw review.body, um, that's the source. The good news is this is actually really uncommon. Like people usually don't do this in their Elixir apps, but I have an example to show everyone, which is kind of cool. It's how you get this exact same problem from file upload. So, oh yeah, I gotta stop this one to show you that. But essentially this is a very basic web application. And the only function of it is to, you know, upload a file just because that's the relevant part for this. So I'm going to just upload like a photo of a cat and you can see like view photo black cat.jpg. So that's the intention is like you can, there, there's some website you can upload photos to it. Now let's look at the code that does this. So the way the upload works is you can see, you know, the upload, this is like a binary file. Um, well, it's actually a struct in a plug. So you can see this is a pattern match on the content type, the file name, and the path of upload. So after you get that you know, information, I have an image server, which is like a gen server on the back end, and it's putting the file name, the content type, and then you know the path. Path is actually not user-controlled, kind of a common misconception. 
when you upload a file, plug kind of does this automatically for you. It'll just put it in a temporary directory. Uh, this is it. You can see like this, this data is not user controlled. So you can't actually do like a file, like a path traversal. Um, don't worry about that for now. Just kind of focus on the fact that you can upload a file and the content type, like the binary structure of that file is not being checked. So this is, you know, like an image file. When it gets, you know, read back, the image server gets the file name and there's content type in the, the binary. And you can see put response content type and then send the response with the, the bin. So we're only expecting image files, right? But, you know, what happens if I go back here and let's say I upload, um, well, I'll, sh I'll show you the contents of this file first. So CD desktop at, so it's literally just the text, you know, script alert one and script. That's, that's all this file does. It pops the alert. So I'm going to upload it and you can kind of imagine like what's going to happen. Anyone that views this file, cross-site scripting happens. And the reason is that in the design of the application, you know, the, the author wasn't expecting people to upload like HTML files. Um, not expected, but it, it does happen. So Soblo can detect this as well. This is a much more common like problem compared to the raw issue, just because when you're doing file upload, it's very tricky. Like if you have a high security web application, this is not the only problem you'll run into with file upload. It is a very big focus um, for any web application, like where you're doing file upload, that's a big security focus. Like pen testers are gonna focus on it. Real attackers are gonna focus on it because problems like this are, are very common. So if you're wondering like the secure way to do this, it would not be to check like the file name because you could name a file like .html and it's really a PNG underneath. What you wanna do is inspect the content of it um, like the, it's called magic bytes in some way, but essentially the, like the binary data, you know, does it look like a PNG or is it a, um, or is it like an HTML file? And then when you render it on the user side, you know, put response content type, it should only be text or it should only be like PNG or JPEG, for example, it should never be text HTML because that's how the, the cross-site scripting problem happens. So, you know, kind of in conclusion, the raw example is kind of easy to get your head around. Um, the, the file uploads like a little trickier, but it is, it is relevant for sure. Um, so yeah, that concludes cross-site scripting. I'll take a, take a break here. Anyone have questions or you can unmute or just ask in chat. Would there be any way someone could put like a few raw bytes at the beginning of the file and, you know, fake out being a PNG or something like that? And that, is that possible? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the good news is it won't render like the browser oh, okay. will be like, hey, this is corrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Because the goal is to get like an HTML file to render, you know. Gotcha. But yeah, it's, it's like the combination of the valid bytes and then also the content type of the response being a text HTML. It, it seems like there are like two, two levels, levels of uh, uh, severity here. I mean, you have on one hand things that uh, if you really push the edges of uh, what X to protect you from, you so below will tell you so. And, if you really know what you're doing, that's not a problem. If you shouldn't have done it, you just stop doing it. <laughs> Whereas something like this, I mean, it can say you're doing a file upload, <laughs> probably like probably copying and pasting some example you found somewhere, and you should really think harder about that. But I mean, what's the next step if you get that kind of if someone gets that? Yeah, it, it's it's like hard because there's not like a magic bullet where you're where you're like you can buy something or or you can you know you kind of have to know about it. Um, yeah. it's not a very satisfying answer. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the reality of it is you know file upload is just difficult. Yeah, and but remember, when you do like um, a security check, what, what what is kind of like the best response for a tool that does security scanning to do in a situation like that? Do you try to educate the user? Do you say you should think harder about that? I mean, what, what's the kind of preferred response? From oh, your oh yeah. Um, so that's actually the thing with Praxial. Um, Cause I'll show you the cross-site scripting. 
um, like for severity here, this is the same for the, um, the put response content type, but it'll tell you like, this is a high severity finding, you know, like if you have this problem, it'll lead to, let me actually show you the, um, see if I can pull that up for you. The Sobolo guide, it's put response content type. Yeah. So like, this is a high severity finding. Like, I think I actually linked to the MySpace Sammy worm in it. Um, and then I have this example. So the good news is like, Sobolo will at least point you to this. If like, if you have that file upload problem and you're using put response content type, you'll get kind of like a hint. And then my goal with, um, you know, like the open source or like the Soblo, you know, information is to just kind of help people like kind of be aware of this. I also actually wrote a blog post on this topic that kind of goes into detail. Um, yeah. Griffin talks about it in his ElixirConf talk too. Griffin is the uh, creator of Soblo. Um, yeah. So yeah, I guess kind of part of my work is trying to, to get the word out, so to speak on it. You know, Michael, the thing is, I think the people sitting on this conference are probably not the ones who need to hear this because we care enough about security to get on here and, and watch this. The thing is, the best security tool in the world won't do you any good if you don't run it. And, you know, same thing with like Sobolo. You know, so if someone doesn't run it, it'll never show them those vulnerabilities. It'll never. So it, it's all, you know, yeah, it, the problem is the people who don't think to run this stuff and they'll be the ones who pay the price for, you know, for it in terms of like their sites getting hacked and stuff like this. Yeah, yeah it's unfortunate. You pay for security um, eventually, no matter what. Um, my hope, though, is with um, like kind of tools like with Praxial IO, for example, um, part of the enterprise plan if you pay for like, you know, the kind of the top tier, you actually get some consulting hours where you can say, hey, like Soblo, you know, showed this finding, like, I don't really know what it means. Could you take a look for me? Um, so I'm hoping that'll help kind of Elixir developers with, you know, dealing with these problems as well. All right, nice. The severity discussion is really good too, where, um, you know, like, SQL injection is generally very severe because anyone can probably create an account and send the attack. With cross-site scripting, it depends. Like if you have a, a social media application or you can leave reviews, you can see how you know users can create new reviews and everyone can see them. Whereas banking applications generally try to restrict that like as much as possible. Usually bank apps don't let you like view other users or send them messages, which is a good thing. Um, for sure, you you definitely want that more lockdown or or like you could you could imagine this conversation. Maybe there's a banking you know app where the, hey we want users to upload a picture of themselves because you know they'd like that it would be kind of cool. But then the security people are like, could we please not do that? Like the security benefits are really good for avoiding that feature. Um, but yeah, so let's go on to the last example here, which is cross-site request forgery. So this one is a little tricky to understand. So if you're kind of like struggling with it, don't worry. It, it might take a few, you know, like a few tries to really get it. But essentially, web applications, when you're logged in, you want to perform some kind of action. So in a banking portal, you want to like move money. Or on social media, you want to create a new post. So Due to the, just the way like web browsers and the internet works, a malicious website can trigger a get or a post request in a victim's web browser to a different website. Um, this is just how it is. Like if you visit a malicious website, they can trigger a post request like on your Google account. Um, Google probably has cross-site request forgery protection, which is good. Um, so let's kind of dive into what that means. So this is what a post request basically looks like. You have localhost 4000. This is just our potion shop example. And you can see we're doing a post to the review endpoint. And what this looks like is you can see the review body, the review score, and the review email. And then this is a cross-site request forgery token. So when an attacker is doing this you know, cross-site request forgery attack, they basically need to know in advance all of these parameters. So the review body, like an attacker would be writing something like, haha, like I am, you know, stupid or whatever. Here's, you know, the user's email. 
they would have to have this information in advance. And they could for like most things on the internet, like the, the format of creating a tweet, that post request, anyone that uses Twitter knows it. The secret value though, the CSERF token, you know, they can't predict it. So this is generated by the server, included in the request, but there's a really important part. The web server has to check that this CSERF token is actually, you know, the one it generated. You could do a CSERF attack where you just put some nonsense value in here. And if the backend web server doesn't check it, it's still vulnerable. So the reason that this kind of attack works is because the way that your authentication session happens is through um, a cookie. So when you submit a post request, this cookie is automatically included in the request. And that's what's causing, you know, like the request to succeed or fail. The web application says, okay, Michael's logged in. He wants to leave a review on this thing. Here's a session cookie that maps to his session. We're going to allow him to do that. Um, the thing is, this is automatically included in post requests. So that's kind of the source of this problem. So let's walk through this attack. We have potionshop.com and maliciouscoupons.com. Step one, you have to log in to potionshop.com and that's your current session. People today are logged into a lot of tabs so you can kind of see how, how this works. Step two, while logged in on that web browser, the user visits maliciouscoupons.com. Step three, maliciouscoupons.com is gonna trigger a form submit on potionshops.com. And then the user's current session is submitted with the form. And this allows the attacker to create a new review as the victim. So let me show you how this works. First, let's explore. I just wanna show you the value of this file. So this is the proof of concept to create like a new review on Potion Shop. This is just a normal form, um, but you can see the absence of like a CSERF token. So we're just submitting this request without any kind of like, we don't know that in advance. We're just hoping that it doesn't verify it. So this HTML would be hosted on a different website from Potion Shop. Um, and then you would visit it and would submit automatically. It's gonna look like this for today, just because I wanna show you kind of what's happening. In the real world, this JavaScript would execute this in the background and you would not notice until um, you know, the bad event had already happened. So let me make sure Push and Shop is running. All right, so you can see I'm logged in on Push and Shop and you're like, this is an attacker, uh -huh. one star. So I would be visiting the malicious coupon site, submit the review. And, and this, is, I, this is really good to show you. You can see I actually have to be logged in for the attack to work. Um, I'm not logged in currently, so I'm just going to do that. Now I'm logged in. Let's go back, back to the potion. This is like the attack page. So you see like being logged in is a prerequisite to this attack working. So it kind of reduces the impact compared to like SQL injection. So submit the review. And you can see it worked. Uh, it's also vulnerable to cross-site scripting, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, so this review was written by an attacker due to the cross-site request forgery problem. So let's inspect the, um, the source code. And you can see cross-site request forgery token is actually here. So Phoenix automatically includes this token for you, but the problem is it's not being checked on the back end. So in your router, you know, there's two pipelines here. I just created one that's vulnerable to show you. Protect from forgery. This is the plug that's checking that that token is, is valid on the back end. But with our the pipeline for this route, you can see there's no protect from forgery. So that's why, you know, the, the server isn't checking that value. That's why this is vulnerable. So let's go to the Sobla findings and see what this looks like. And this is interesting. There's actually two CSERF findings here. So the first is missing CSERF protection. This is pretty standard. It's what we just talked about where, you know, the essentially the protect from forgery plug is not being used. Um, that one we just talked about. But there's another one called action reuse. And I want to talk about this because cross-site request forgery, that's like a very common term. That's like a standard term in InfoSec. 
action reuse is like a specific Soblo Phoenix thing. Like if you Google this or you ask chat GPT about it, it won't give you um, much information. So what action reuse means, it's very much related to like Phoenix as a framework where let's say you have an edit bio, um, like an edit bio function in, in Potion Shop here. So I'm going to go to settings. I'm going to edit my bio, like hello. Update bio. Okay. The pipeline for the bio update here, it's going through browser. So we have a CSERF token in this form and it's being checked. Why are we getting this problem with cross-site requests for tree then? You, you, I was confused by this at first. And the root cause of it is because of the route for update bio. So let me show you. So you can see on, it's on line 98 in router. So we go to line 98 and this is the pattern. So you notice that the post request is actually not vulnerable. The problem is the get request here. We're user setting edit bio here. If we go to user setting controller, it's like this pair of code is the problem where edit bio is expecting like a post request in Elixir to go through post here and then hit edit bio. The problem is the format of that post request exactly matches like a get request where you just have it in like the URL parameters. So the reason you should never do state changing actions via a get is because you can't have CSERF protection. So essentially you can just do a get request to this edit bio page, like get a victim to do a get request. It'll hit the exact same controller function and the person's bio will update. Um, it was, it's really a tricky like thing with kind of how the router is hooked up to the controller functions, but it was really clever of, I think Griffin to include this in Soblo because this is like a CSERF problem where it's not related to like the CSERF token or anything. It's literally just, you have an action, which is state changing. And you kind of know that because there's a post for it. And for some reason, somebody also included a get in the router. So that's why this is vulnerable to CSERF where the get request is triggering that action of updating the bio when it should be exclusively a, a post. So that kind of covers, Michael, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can you put that code back up for a second? Yeah, what's up? Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you the question while I was in my mind. The 98 and 99 are a problem. 101 and 102 are not a problem, even though they have the same path because one is at it and the other's update. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Thank you. Oh yeah, I should I should mention this. So edit and update, like the edit, it, it looks like it's, but update is like the real one. So if you go to user controller here, it's user settings. This page that I'm on right now is rendered by edit, but then update is what happens when you actually do the put request. Um, so that's why it's like, notice like these are different and these are the same, the same action. So it's like, that's where you get action, um, action reuse from in the naming really really clever of griffin i'm but yeah not many people know about this like even if you're kind of up on cross-site request forgery this you know problem can be tricky but i hope you know more people kind of know about it now yeah as i thought i thought it must be the fact that the uh the atom at the end of the get in the post was the same i just wanted to make sure i was understanding right thank you yeah no thank you for that that's a really good call out um nice so that kind of concludes the talk for today. Thank you for joining if you're on this call now or if you're watching on YouTube. Um, here's my contact information. Please feel free to send me an email, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to chat about Elixir security. So I'm gonna stop the recording now.